have a word of prayer as we uh, get started. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for seeing us through the first part of this study tonight. We know it's a lot of, st a lot of things to cover, but we've arrived at this place, at this time, to study your word, and we're so grateful, Father, that we can take this all in, and we can study for ourselves, and we can make discoveries with your spirit. We want to be ready for Jesus to come, but we also want to share with our friends. And so, Lord, uh, just help us to do that in the same way that Jesus did, with kindness and love, but with the straight truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Time of the end, part two. All right. Now, as we get started, I want to... I want to establish an important principle in studying Bible prophecy. The language of Bible prophecy is symbolic, okay? So the language is what, everybody? Symbolic. symbolic. And, you know, often a prophetic day is used to represent a literal year, okay? For example... When Jesus tells the church of Smyrna that they're going to suffer persecution for 10 days, that's Revelation 2 and verse 10, that actually turned out to be 10 years, okay? And that's, that's amazing. It was the time of real persecution under the Roman Emperor Diocletian. It took place for 10 years, okay? Now, this is a fairly prominent feature of Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. I want to give you just an example, all right? In Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, God says to Ezekiel, I have, given, I have laid on you a day for each year. Okay, so the prophet Ezekiel was instructed to act out uh, 40 years of Israel's rebellion, okay? And so what he did was he lied on his side for 40 days, okay? Okay? And God said, I have laid on you a day for each year. Okay? Now, the same thing happens in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. You want to write that down, all right? If you remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt and they were headed to the promised land... They're on the border of the promised land, right? And uh, there are 12 spies sent out into the promised land, okay? And they were sent out into the land for 40 days. They come back. They're carrying all sorts of luscious, beautiful fruit and the abundance of the land. Remember, it was called the land of milk and honey, right? But 10 of those spies gave a bad report, all right? Two of them gave a good report. But because everybody believed the bad report, they spent 40 years wandering out in the desert, okay? So the spies were in there for 40 days. And then they ended up wandering in the wilderness for how long? 40 years, okay? So in Bible prophecy, a prophetic day equals one literal year, okay? All right. I'm glad we got to cover that. <laughs> all right. Just as a quick, 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 quick review, all right, of Daniel chapter 2. And the reason why we're going through Daniel 2 again is because I want to fix in your mind the sequence of empires, okay? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the division of Rome, all right? <laughs> Giving us world history in advance. And as we move from prophecy to prophecy, from Daniel 2 to Daniel 7 to Daniel 8 to Daniel 9, I mean, you know, it's repeating, but it's also what? Enlarging. Enlarging. That's right. Okay. All right. So in Daniel 8, we have the same kingdom. So we're doing a little review here. You have the ram, 
that represented the Medes and the Persians, right? And we know this for sure because Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel 8 and verse 20, yes, this ram is the Medes and the Persians, right? Okay? And the same thing with the goat, okay? The goat with the notable horn, the Greeks with Alexander, okay? The first king. The horn breaks off. It was replaced by four horns, right? Four new horns. And uh, that was predicting the rise of the four generals, right, that took Alexander's place. So we're getting more details, aren't we? Okay? All right. Then the next thing we see is a little horn. Now you would think, oh, a little horn. How cute. Huh? All right. Well, the little horn actually represents Rome, okay? Both in its united phase and then in its divided phase, okay? And it covers the same ground as the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, all right? Okay, so we have a ram, a goat, a little horn. Then there's another part. And that little part is found in Daniel 8 and verse 14. It was the 2300 days, okay? And of course, this part of the prophecy was completely different, wasn't it? There's no animals, there's no horns, uh, there's no conquest. It's a prediction of time. So for everything else, Gabriel gives a lot of detail, right? Animals, all these kinds of things. Gabriel, I mean, wow, can you imagine? Gabriel comes and he says, look, this prophecy is for many days in the future. But Daniel gets upset, doesn't he? He gets upset and he gets sick. He knows it's important, but he can't understand. Specifically, he can't understand the 2,300 days. But you and I discovered something very, very interesting. In Daniel 8 and verse 17, we discovered that this vision refers to when? The time of the end. Exactly. All right, so in Daniel 8 and verse 19, we found out that the 2300 days refers to an appointed time at the end, right? And then we discovered that Paul describes the last day, a last day event that is appointed as well. The Apostle Paul says he has appointed a day on which he will do what? Judge, Judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And who's the man that God has ordained? Jesus. Jesus Christ, that's right. That event is the judgment, okay? Now, then we looked at the prophecy itself. We saw that in, in 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be what? Cleansed. Cleansed, all right? So we went to the rest of the Bible to gather our information about the cleansing of the sanctuary, okay? And uh, so we have three big Clues, all right? It's a prophecy about the time of the end. It's a prophecy uh, about a time that's already appointed. And it has something to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. So when we look at all the evidence, the theme of the judgment comes up again and again. And there's no doubt that God is pointing us to the Old Testament sanctuary so that we understand, okay? And, and so that we get an important point, an important really key for unlocking the book of Revelation. Now, we covered this already, but there's no question that the language of Daniel chapter 8 is sanctuary language. Even the animals, okay? The ram and the goat, all right? These are these, these symbols, all right, were animals that were used in the sacrifices of the sanctuary. All right. 
So we went back into the Old Testament and we discovered some very interesting things. We discovered something about that sanctuary, that it was looking forward to Jesus, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what this altar represents. The altar is like the cross, okay? But after the cross, after you and I come to the cross, what does God do with us? He cleans us up, right? All right? He cleans us of all unrighteousness. We need that before we can really be in the presence of God. All right, so then we went inside. We noticed that there were two compartments, the holy place and what else? The most holy place, right. Okay, good. And in the holy place, you have the seven-branch candlestick, right? It was pointing to Jesus, the light of the world. You have the table of showbread. Jesus is the bread of life, okay? And you have this priest that was also a symbol of Jesus, right? Who was the great high priest in heaven, right? And then you have the altar of incense that represents the prayers that are being mixed with the righteousness of Christ before they ascend to the presence of of God. So there's a lot of things that we learn from the Old Testament sanctuary. And then we have the most holy place. And in the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's a symbol of God's throne. This is, this is the place where the presence of God would literally take up residence right there between the two angels or the two cherubim, okay? How do we know all this? Well, the Bible tells us in Exodus 25 and verse 22, I will speak with you from above the what? Mercy. The mercy seat. From between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony. All right? Where do we always go for our answers, friends? Bible. We always go to the Bible, right? So the sanctuary is one of the most important keys for understanding Revelation. And if you read the book of Revelation very carefully, you're going to find sanctuary language all the way through. Okay? Now, in Revelation chapter 11, John sees the throne of God in vision. Notice what it says. Then the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. In heaven. And what was seen in the temple? The Ark of His Covenant was seen in His temple. All right? Back in Revelation 1 and verse 13, it says that Jesus was in the midst of the seven what? Lampstands. Remember in the holy place? Okay? All right, you guys are catching on to this. Sure. Okay, in Revelation 5 and verse 6, it says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures... And in the midst of the elders stood a what? Lamb. A lamb as though it had been Lame. slain. Sanctuary language, okay? Revelation 8 and verse 3, it says, Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. altar. Huh? All right, very good. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Ah, very good. You guys are getting this, aren't you? Huh? Yeah. So, folks, this is why it's so important to go back into the rest of the Bible. I have heard people speculate about the book of Daniel, about the book of Revelation. I go, man, where in the world did you get that? You know? But what we need to do, what we always need to do, is we need to study the scriptures. Okay? Amen. And so when we give you these principles and keys, we're giving you what you need to study the Bible. Okay? And that's an important thing. Um, I, I pointed this out the last time we were together, which was last night, um, that there are Christians through the centuries who have given their lives so that you and I can have the Bible. You know? And, and when we meet those people in heaven, we need to honor them. You know? Okay? Just like we honor our veterans today, right? We need to honor, honor them because they're veterans of a different war, right? Okay, and we're going to talk about that war, by the way, when we get to Revelation chapter 12. <laughs> okay, all right. 
Um, here's another one, Revelation 14, verses 15 through 18. It says, and another angel came out of the what? The temple. the temple. And cried with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So you not only have the furniture and things that are referred to, but you also have the feasts that are referred to. Remember? There was a feast of the harvest, right? All right. Very good. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then the rest become a part of the harvest at his coming. All right. All sanctuary language. Notice once again, it says, Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over, well, I almost forgot that word, over fire, there. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle and gather the cluster of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So you see the harvest language, right? Okay, it has a lot to do with the feasts. So that's why we studied the heavenly sanctuary, okay? Because this is a key to understanding what Daniel and Revelation are talking about. Okay, very good. Now, in other parts of the Bible, you have sanctuary language as well. I mean, the people are looking beyond what was on the earth to what is in heaven, okay? Uh, Isaiah 6 and verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the what? Temple. Filled the temple. That's right. Okay. Very good. All right. Now, I think we've covered this pretty thoroughly tonight. Just remember that these feasts were all pointing towards, you know, times in Jesus' life and ministry. Okay. And, and it is so important because when you think about the sevens, remember the seven, remember we studied the seven seals, right? And where did the seven seals take us? It started in John's time and went all the way to the what? To the second coming of Jesus, didn't it? Well, these feasts also pointing forward to things coming in the future, in the life of Jesus, okay? And beyond. All right. Very good. And here they're listed once again, Okay. And you know, these really testify to us that God keeps his promises. Amen. All right? Very good. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of details about the Day of Atonement. Some of us are used to hearing Yom Kippur. How many of you have heard that saying? Yom Kippur, right? Right? Remember, before the Day of Atonement, ten days before, there were trumpets that blew, right? Warning, the day is coming, right? Get right with God. And then during the Day of Atonement, they had this special ritual to cleanse the temple. And it's a ceremony that you find in Leviticus chapter 16. Okay? It says there, Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting. Why would the sanctuary need cleansing or atonement? Because something is there that shouldn't be there, right? Okay? All year long, the sins of Israel are symbolically being transferred from the sinner to the sacrifice to the sanctuary, right? You remember the sinner would confess his sins over the head of the lamb, right? The lamb throat, the lamb's throat was cut. They would take the blood and apply it to the sanctuary. And that was symbolically transferring the sin to the sanctuary. But I want to make a very important point. When that sin was transferred to the sanctuary, it was transferred in blood. Whose blood covers our sins? Christ. 
and important, important detail. All right? So, I think you guys are getting the symbolism here, right? So, in the sanctuary, the sins that are recorded there are recorded in blood. Okay? All right. Then he shall make atonement for the holy place, the holy sanctuary, right? And he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting. So all year long, these things would take place. Okay, come on, man. Don't, don't freeze up on me now. Mm. All right. Thank you. Uh, I can whistle. <laughs> Let's see if the battery's got a little bit out of whack here. I've probably been banging this thing around. You know? Alright, let's see. Come on. Don't do that to me. Alright, we'll see if you go backwards. Do your arrow keys work on the keyboard? I've got a cursor. All right, let's see. Let's try this. Okay, let's try this. Now, on the Day of Atonement, only the high priest went into the most holy place once a year. Okay? It happened on the Day of Atonement. So, uh, imagine, this is a very solemn ceremony. Okay. Israel is gathered there at the sanctuary. Two goats were chosen. Okay. One was called the Lord's goat, okay, and that was the sacrifice. Okay. The blood of that goat was carried into the sanctuary. And of course, it's a symbol of the blood of Christ, right? Okay. So, so the high priest who's a symbol of Jesus Christ, went alone into the most holy place carrying that blood. And what he would do is he would sprinkle blood on the lid of the ark. Anybody know how many times? Seven. Hey, seven. All right. Very good. Yeah. Maybe that number seven comes up again, right? And the lid that was on the ark was called the mercy seat. Okay? This was a solemn who knows what was inside the ark? Anybody? Ten commandments. Ten commandments, right? So you have the mercy seat on the top. You have the law inside, right? <clears throat> you have mercy and justice. All right? Very good. Somehow, those two have to be reconciled. Okay? And they're only reconciled through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? And this is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Ah, it's working. Very good. All right. Hebrews 9 and verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins. Okay. So the high priest went into the second compartment, the most holy place, by himself, just once a year, and he offered the blood in the presence of God. He did that on Yom Kippur. He did that on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment. Okay? And he did it every year, every year. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When did that happen? At the cross. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, right? The temple, the veil of the temple was torn in two. That was the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. No more animal sacrifices. Okay? And that is very important for us to get. Because the real Lamb of God had just died on the cross. In the courtyard, of the heavenly sanctuary. And as you know, after the resurrection, 
And Jesus spent some time with his disciples. He ascended to heaven. And he went there to that heavenly sanctuary to be our high priest. Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> Hebrews 9 and verse 24 says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. All right? Okay, wonderful. So the real Lamb of God is there in the real sanctuary as the real high priest, okay? And so I wanted to get this all fresh in our minds, okay? Because we're going to come back to Daniel 8 in verse 14. So it says... For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. When will the sanctuary be cleansed? Ah. Yes. Okay. It's going to happen. It's the day of judgment. So what is Daniel trying to tell us? Well, Gabriel comes back. And, exp and finishes explaining this. Remember, he fainted, right? He was sick many days, and it says that nobody understood, okay? But you think God's going to leave him like that? No. In Daniel chapter 9, the chapter opens with Daniel praying for understanding. And while he's praying, then suddenly he gets a visitor, the angel Gabriel, the same angel who visit him, visited him at the beginning of the vision. All right? And it says, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill <coughs> to what? Understand. So, Daniel, I know that you didn't understand. I'm back. Okay? And now I'm going to explain it to you, all right? So for the rest of the chapter here, Gabriel explains it. And he gives Daniel something known as the 70-week prophecy, okay? But before we go into that, I want to review a principle of Bible prophecy and then add one more, okay? All right, let's see if you remember this. In Bible prophecy... One prophetic day equals one year. year. Ah, very good. Okay, now, I want to give this to you. Remember this, that when you go from B.C. to A.D., there is no zero year. Everybody got that? Okay, so, you know... No one back then was going to say that they were born in the year zero. All right? In other words, if I was back then, I wouldn't say, I was born March 19, zero. Right? That just doesn't make any sense. Okay? Is everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Let's see if we can get past this now. Ah, I almost had a heart attack there. Okay. So when Gabriel begins to explain the missing part of the prophecy in Daniel 8, this is what he says. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So let me ask you, who are Daniel's people? What are they, what do we call them? The Jews, the Jews right? The Jews. Okay. And which city would Daniel be referring to? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Very good. So what Gabriel is saying is something that's very important. Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people. 70 weeks are cut off from this prophecy for your people and for your holy city. It's 70 weeks from the 2300 prophetic days of Daniel chapter 8. Okay, now let me ask you something. How many days in a week? Seven. Seven. How many weeks do we have? Seventy. So what's 70 times 7? 490. 490. 
wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay? So we have the 2,300 days, right? But then he says, 70 weeks are for your people. 70 weeks or 490 days of the 2,300 are for your people, Daniel. Okay? Very important for us. We're starting to put this together, okay? So that first part is a prophecy about the Jews and the city of Jerusalem. Okay? But at this point, we still don't know where the prophecy starts. But Gabriel is about to explain that to us. Isn't that deep? Okay? He says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Let's just stop right there. Okay? I want you to catch this. The going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Okay? shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Okay? So, when did the decree to rebuild Jerusalem go out? Now, I'm going to explain it to you. Under the Persians, there were sev several different decrees that went out that allowed the Jews to return to the promised land, okay? But there's only one that took effect, and that was in 457 B.C. under a king, a Persian king by the name of Artaxerxes, okay? And not only did he let them go back, he actually financed their mission, okay? And he gave them everything that they and you can read about this, you write down, Ezra chapter 7. There's a book in the Bible called Ezra. Ezra chapter 7, okay? The starting date is 457 B.C., okay? Seven, or eight chapters. Seven, yes. Ezra chapter 7. Okay, now... It says here, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, and then it says unto, whoa, unto who? Messiah. Messiah, the prince. Whoa. So in all the calculating that we're doing, I don't want you to miss this. Daniel, he says, after 69 weeks, Messiah is going to come. We have 70 weeks, right? But then he says, after 69 weeks, Messiah is going to come. So when does the 70 weeks begin, friends? For what? 457 B.C. All right. So here's what we know, okay? We have 457 B.C. And Gabriel said that it would be 40, excuse me, 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince. That's 483 years. Remember, it's a prophetic day for a literal year, right? Okay, so you add one to the total. And when you cross the B.C. A.D. line, remember, right, no zero year, and that will bring you to a specific date. It will bring you to 27 A.D., okay? And the question is, did the Messiah show up on time? Yes, sir. Ah, how do you know that? In the Bible. Hey, thank you. Yeah, you guys want to see it in the Bible? Yeah, okay. Turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. We're going to start right at the beginning of the chapter. Okay? Luke chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. It says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius 
Caesar. What year was it? The 15th year, right? Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etruria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Okay? So there is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, right? And all these people are all in these places, right? Okay? Now I want you to notice what happens in that year. John the Baptist comes down to the Jordan. He starts preaching. He starts baptizing. And I want you to notice what happens in verse, verses 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that who was also baptized? Jesus was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, and in you I am well pleased. Did the Messiah show up on time? Yes. Yeah. yeah, cool, isn't it? The word Messiah means anointed one. I'm going to give you a text. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Write it down, look it up later. Peter, when he's referring to Jesus, okay, and his baptism, he says it's his anointing. All right? Okay. Woo! Isn't that cool? So, uh, now, some of you got the DVD from the first night, and some of you didn't, but the DVD from the first night went through this whole prophecy right here, and some other information. There can be no other person other than Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. Nobody else. And that excites me. Okay, because we know the true Savior of the world. Okay, so Jesus comes down to the Jordan in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. He is baptized, he is anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he begins his work as our Messiah. All right, everybody following so far? All right, great, excellent. All right, now, the end of the 70 weeks, or the 490 years, takes us down to 34 A.D. Remember, there's one week left at the end, right? And if we have a prophetic week, which is made up of seven prophetic days, we have seven literal what? Years. years. Okay, so there's seven years between 27 A.D. and 34 A.D., okay? What happened at the end of the 70 weeks in 34 A.D.? What actually takes place? How many of you ever heard of a man named Stephen who was stoned? Okay. Um, Stephen stands before the Jewish rulers. It was called the Sanhedrin. Okay. He stands before them and he begins to preach this sermon. This spirit-filled sermon. And he gets down toward the end. And his point is this. You have rejected the Messiah. Turn from your rejection and accept it. Basically, I'm summarizing. Okay? They got so upset with him. You know what they did? They dragged him out and they stoned him to death. They rejected the message that Jesus was the Messiah. That ended their time. They had 490 years to accept the message that the Messiah was coming, right? And when he came, they rejected him. And right there, when Stephen was stoned, friends, they rejected the Messiah. All right? Now, I want us to get that. Um, I want us to get that very clear that this is a prophecy about the Messiah. It's about Jesus. Because there are many people, many people who, I mean, they, they, they think they study Bible prophecy, 
but all they do is read a bunch of books by somebody else. And they think that this 70 weeks, especially the last week, has to do with the Antichrist. And so what they do is they take a prophetic scissor, I guess you would call it that, and they cut off the last week, and they throw it into the future somewhere, and they say, that's the Antichrist. But who is this really referring to, friends? It's referring to Jesus, isn't it? Not the Antichrist, but the true Christ. Okay. All right. So, the end of the 490 years is 34 A.B., right? All right. Now, we're just going to kind of walk through this. And I put up a little picture of the stoning of Stephen that I got off the internet. You know, you know how they say it? Google it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I Googled and I found this picture. Um, I, I want to encourage you to, to read Acts chapter 7. Sometime, read it. It's the story of Stephen, okay? And so this prophecy, I mean, think about it. He was used to make a last appeal to the Jews before this time of this prophetic time was over. Wow. Did you know we're at the end of time as well? We don't know when Jesus is going to come. We don't have a date or anything like that. But you and I have been called to preach the gospel in the end. Remember? Remember what Jesus said? In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then what? The end will come. That's right. So you and I are modern day Stephens. So according to the Bible, now, now that the nation of Israel, their probation time was over, the time that was allotted to them was over, okay? The gospel then went to the rest of the world. Then went to the Gentiles. Everybody that was not, quote unquote, an Israelite, okay? But, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we can be Israelites, okay? And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's what? Seed and heirs according to the promise. You and I are descendants of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Amen. Now listen to what else Paul had to say. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one where? Inwardly, right? And that circumcision is of the what? It's of the heart. I want to be very clear with you tonight. The people of Israel will always have a special place in the heart of God, all right? But the sharp distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles is now gone, all right? And you know what? It was always supposed to disappear anyway. Yeah. You know, the, the Jews were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, okay? They were always called to be that. They were to call the Gentiles into the covenant family. But you know what? They failed. And by the time Jesus comes on the scene, I mean, man, think about it. Um, remember the story of the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. right? There's this wounded Jew, right? And, and a Levite comes by. What does he do? Nothing. Nothing. He just walks by on the other side. The next guy comes along, right? The priest. And what does he do? They wouldn't even touch somebody. Oh, that makes me unclean. And therefore, you know, I'll be lost if I don't get clean. You know, kind of stuff like that. But who comes along? A Samaritan, right? Hated by the Jews. But he's the one who helps the Jew, right? Okay? Yeah. So look, after the 490 years was over, after that time was allotted to the Jews, the gospel went to the Gentiles. And now we share it with the whole world, including the Jews. Okay? 
Everybody got that? Yes. All right? Very good. I want you to listen to what the Bible says here. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. There is no distinction. It is gone. The time was up. The 70 weeks of the 490 years that was allotted to Daniel's people was up. Stephen was put to death, and the gospel goes to the rest of the world. All right, is that clear to everybody? Yes. Yeah. All right, very good. All right. And so that's what happened in 34 AD. So, so you know, we, we, we've got the decree of Artaxerxes, right? 457 B.C. We have the baptism of Jesus or his anointing as the, as the Messiah that happened right on schedule, right? We have the uh, close of the time set aside for Daniel's people, 34 A.D. And at that, I mean, that's amazing enough, right? There's more. <clears throat> Notice what it says. And after the 62 weeks, remember there was the 7 and then the 62, right? After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be what? Oh. Cut off. But not for himself. Okay? And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, so let's take this in for a moment. So after the 62 weeks, Okay, which is part of the 69, right? Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. So when was Messiah cut off? What do we, what do we typically point to? The what? The cross. the cross. That's when he was cut off. Not for himself, but for who? Amen. That's right. Okay? And that did happen after his baptism, right? Then Gabriel says that someone would come and destroy the temple. Again, that did happen in 70 AD when the Roman general by the name of Titus marched into Jerusalem and absolutely destroyed the temple. Okay? So you've got the death of Jesus, right? And the sack of Jerusalem. Okay, so let's put that up. some point after his baptism Jesus dies on the cross and we know that it happened before the stoning of Stephen so we'll put it right here in the middle just for now okay it happens after the 69 weeks that is very specific but it gets even more specific than that notice the slide Daniel 9 and verse 27 then he shall confirm a covenant with many for how long one week, right? But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Okay? So we're talking about that last prophetic week. And it says, in the middle of the week. Okay? So let me ask you. All right? If you have a week, a prophetic week, or that's seven years long, what's in the middle? Three and a half. That's right. It says here that in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And he did that on the cross, right? When he gave his life there. And that's when the hand of God ripped the veil in two. It's clearly a prophecy about who? Jesus. As I mentioned before, you can read some books, okay? And they will try to say that this is a prophecy about the Antichrist. All right? They want to take prophetic scissors and they want to cut that off and they want to throw it into the future. Don't let anybody tell you that, please. <laughs> This is a prophecy about the Messiah, the Messiah, the Prince, our Jesus, who was cut off, not for himself, but for us, okay? 
Messiah brought an end to sacrifices. That is exactly what Jesus did. All right? So in the middle of the week, all right, which brings us to the spring of 31 AD, Jesus dies on the cross of Calvary. And he brings an end to all the sacrifices in the temple. It happened right on time. Okay, did you capture that? Yeah. It's right on time. That blesses me. You know that? That blesses me. More than 500 years in advance, Daniel saw it all. <coughs> and he even gave us the dates. Okay? So there's no question that the Bible is not a human document. It is inspired by God. Amen. All right. All right. What's that place called again, Randy? Chicharos. <laughs> okay. I am headed there. Okay. Now, I want to slow it down just for just for a moment. Um, I explained to you what some people have tried to do with this prophecy. Okay? They call it the gap theory. Right? There's this prophetic gap or pause between the 69th week and the 70th. We don't find that there, okay? We don't find it there, all right? Um, this is really referring to the Messiah. If you have that DVD, that is a great witnessing tool, okay? You can share that with unbelievers or people who are skeptics and show them that Jesus truly is the Messiah, okay? Now, I want to think through this for a moment. Let's say that I told you it was 70 miles to my house. Right? So you allow yourself, depending on how you drive, you allow yourself an hour, all right? Okay? And, but after four hours, you still haven't found the right exit on the freeway. So you call me, right? And, 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 and you say, well, I thought you said it was 70 miles. Well, it is, but, but I forgot to tell you that there's 2,000 miles between the 69th mile and the 70th mile. <laughs> Does that make any sense? No. no. It doesn't make any sense in Daniel chapter 9 either, okay? The 70th week comes after the 69th week. Okay, so let's finish up the prophecy. It says, On the wings of abomination shall, one, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Okay? After Jesus dies, what was left desolate. The Bible is very clear about that. The temple was left desolate. Okay? In Matthew 23 and verse 38, Jesus said to the Jews, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Okay? And it was the Romans in A.D. 70 who came in and made it desolate. Okay? Yeah. And you can, you can read, read in Luke and other places, Luke 21, where it says that the abomination of desolation comes to the holy place. Okay? Yeah, it surrounds the place with its armies. Uh, the language is taken right out of Daniel. Okay? So, what we have in, in Daniel chapter 9 is a parallel structure. Okay? And I'm going to show that to you. All right? So you have Messiah cut off. All right? And then you have this prince with, a, with a, a, a lowercase p who destroys the temple. But then the structure in the passage brings us back to the Messiah who ends sacrifices. Right? And then it brings us back to the one who makes the temple desolate. There's a structure 
in Daniel chapter 9. Okay? You know, and, and you know, for us, we think in a linear terms. And you know, we start at the beginning of a sentence, right? And we read all the way through the sentence and we get to the period. Right? That's not how they thought. Okay? And that's why we need to be Bible students. Alright? There's a structure here that really tells us that Jesus really is the Messiah and that the one who makes desolate is really that Roman who came into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Okay? All right. Woo, I wish I was done now, but I'm not. Chicharos, okay? Uh, so I hope that this strengthens your faith, okay? I really do. All right, now we're going to go to the, re to the rest of the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, okay? So, you have 2300 years, right? And remember, there's, between B.C. and A.D., there's no zero year. What does B.C. mean, by the way? What does A.D. mean? It means the year of our Lord. Annus Domine. Very good. Okay. Now, if somebody asks you that, and if that question is worth a thousand dollars, guess what happens? <laughs> you can answer the question. Yeah. Okay. So, if we finish the rest of the prophecy, it brings us to the year 1844. All right. Yes. That's where the prophecy leads us. That is when the heavenly day of atonement or the heavenly judgment began. I know that's new to you. The book of Daniel, the scenes of Daniel are coming to pass. Let's read through this verse here. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. We saw it before, right? I beheld two thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, and his wheel a burning, his wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. What was set? The judgment was set. The books were open. Okay. Wow. Now. Watch what happens. Because the next event tells us something very interesting. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So the moment is coming when the stone will smash the statue. The kingdom of men is going to pass away. The moment is coming when Jesus is going to establish his kingdom and it's going to last how long? Forever. Forever. And he does it the moment judgment is finished. So you know what that means? We're just about there. Praise the Lord. The history of this planet is about <laughs> to finish. The judgment hour is underway. When it's finished, history is over. Okay. When Jesus comes, all decisions are made. Notice what it says in Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And what is he coming with? His rewards, right? His reward is with him to give every man according to his work, according as his work shall be. So, when Jesus comes, he's coming with his what? Rewards. 
So how can Jesus give out rewards when he comes? It's because the judgment has already finished. Yeah. Amen. It happens before he returns. How will the world know that we're in such a time as this? Once again, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting, Everlasting gospel. Did you ever think that the judgment would be part of the gospel? is. Okay? The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred, kindred and tongue and people, <laughs> saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Praise the Lord. You can't say that something's come unless it has arrived, right? There really is a time of the end. And that's where we are right now. And that means that the kingdom of Christ is just around the corner. Amen. All right. God is not going to let human suffering go on forever, friends. No. Because at some point, very, very soon, those books are going to be closed. Jesus is going to come. Praise the Lord. So where are you with Jesus right now? Let's bow our heads for prayer, okay? Lord, thank you so much. We spent a good amount of time tonight studying your word. But it was so rewarding, so fulfilling. We're thankful for that. And now as we go home, Lord, just please be with us. Um, we want our excitement uh, to, to just shine from us. Jesus said he was the light of the world, and then he turned around and said we were the light of the world. And so, Lord, just help us to bring light to our friends and family. Amen. Take us home safely, in Jesus' name.